seeking one. Good block, Thomas said, barely pausing as he swung his staff away to go for another jab at my side. Decent footwork. With a proper weapon, you could even take on a gnoll. I misjudged his strike, a feint, and he knocked me to the ground with his shield. A baby gnoll, separated from its pack and half blind from being born, that is. He chastised me, letting his spear on the ground and watching me. Eyes on me and not my stick. You're not old enough for that just yet. Uh, I grumbled, breathing hard as I pulled myself back to my feet. That's funny. The look on his face made it rather blatant he disagreed. For the last two years, ever since I turned 10, I'd been training to fight with Thomas. I was never going to be a fighter, a warrior, or a real melee combatant. Even if I got a hold of dreading bear or cat forms, I rather doubted I'd favor them. The fantasies of my last life of being a mage were long gone, but I still preferred the idea of keeping monsters, or people, that were trying to kill me at a distance. The spider from the black wall still gave me nightmares on occasion, sometimes mixing with the ones about Mama abandoning me and having her get eaten. But even if I didn't expect to end up in this kind of situation, that didn't mean it wouldn't happen. Plus, it was a good way to get a reflex as to dodge or avoid getting hurt, and to not simply freeze up in a fight. Another round? I asked. I've still got time before Celestine wants me. Thomas looked at the sky, measuring the position of the sun with his fingers for a moment. Donna promised to make me lunch. Not gonna miss that, he said, his lips quirking up. But... ah, fine. I can toss you about for one more go. With magic? I held up a hand and wiggled my fingers. It wasn't at all representative of how I cast spells, but Thomas joked about finger wiggling often enough I'd given up trying to argue. I do need more practice. He grimaced, remembering how it usually went if he couldn't close in time. Thomas was a decent fighter, more than enough to train my pasty and ignorant arse, but he was no great warrior. Fine, but you better not leave grass stains this time. Uh -huh. Can't have you looking bad for Donna, can we? I teased, smiling as I got ready, backing up until we were an acceptable distance from each other. It was hard to categorize spells based on the games. Things just weren't that clear cut here. I vaguely remembered restrictions on where you could cast entangling roots, which made sense, but it wasn't indoors. You needed plant life, something to grow, and a lot of the time it was easier to trip or disrupt than to try to grab. Even dead wood, used as flooring or walls could do in a pinch. It was a lot more effort though, and it was very different depending on what was available. No single entangling root spell that worked the same way each time. Dozens upon dozens of variations. Some plants were eager, others were stubborn. Some were quick to move, and others took their time. Most were happy just being fed nature-aligned magic, life mana. But some took a fair bit of convincing. Usually, only those with some measure of awareness would refuse. I had come a long way from slowly making tunnels of grass to trip up a couple of peasants. Thomas hated the times I used magic in our spars. They were the only times I won. Go, Gwen! Emmeline yelled from off to the side, apparently having come over to watch. Beat up Uncle Tom! Up by his ankles again! A look of pure betrayal flashed over Thomas's face as his little niece cheered for his defeat. And without any further ado, he started a charge, spear held ahead of him. Having expected a more formal start to the fight, I was caught off guard. Months of practice had me dodging and my own staff blocking his jab, turning it aside while I backpedaled away. Moving while trying to cast was hard. Being in a fight just made it harder. There were no formal incantations, no true words, but I had taken to humming, singing under my breath tunes of wonder and nature and legend from the world before. Taruna, runa, runa, rom, I sang teasing and drawing at roots beneath our feet. For all this was a pasture, the roots of the hedgerows ran far and wide. I diverted another jab aimed at my chest, only to have Thomas continue his movements into and through my guard, his elbow driving the wind from me. Gotcha! He yelled, 
standing over me as I sagged away and desperately tried to suck in air. Right as he smirked triumphantly, and Emily let out a cry in dismay, a long root ripped out of the soil and wrapped around his ankle. Emmeline's dismay turned to joy as Thomas yelped, torn from his feet. He threw his fox spear at me defiantly, just barely missing, and I grinned back wildly. Got you, I said, before breaking out into coughing giggles and clutching my chest. Ow. In the span of a few seconds he had gone from standing over me, to being dragged along the ground, to being hoisted into the air by his ankle. Dangling upside down he crossed his arms and glared at me. Thomas didn't like losing. Even if I was using magic, the other militiamen made fun of him for losing to a 12 year old girl and was barely up to his torso. I matched his stare, my staff planted. If I just let him go, he'd restart the fight. Never simply assume an opponent is defeated. It was one of the lessons he'd made sure I'd learned. Carefully, I had another branch of the root twist off, wrapping around him and trapping his torso, reaching for his neck. I healed. Thomas grumbled, ending the fight. He looked over to the clapping Emmeline and shook his fist at her. You little traitor! How could you cheer for your dear old Tom to lose? He yelled. Tom is Tom! Emmeline said, fighting back a giggle fit. But Gwen is big sis! She ran up to us, a white gap toothed smile on her face. You were like, wah, and whoosh, and I was scared he'd get you and Uncle Tom was all mean and hit you and you fell over, but then the root came up and Uncle Tom was all, no, not again. She giggled more. And then he was pulled into the air and you were so cool and then you just stared at him. I want to learn to do that. She latched onto my leg, hugging it and staring at me soulfully. Please, Gwen, teach me, please. I rubbed the top of her head fondly. It's up to Mr. Celestine, not me, I said, getting a wobbly pout that was cute but hardly convincing enough to change my mind. Celestine had already started Emma on lessons. Not magic lessons, but teaching her some of the more mundane aspects of our work. The proper tending of plants, how to judge an animal's well-being, tracking the seasons, and so on. I was roped into teaching her to read and write as well as basic arithmetics since Emma was more willing to tolerate the boring stuff to spend time with me. And Celestine just generally didn't seem to like math for writing much herself. If you would kindly let me down, I've got a date, Thomas said dryly. Emma stopped pouting at my refusal for a moment to look at him and started giggling again. Trying not to laugh myself, there was just something about Thomas's put-upon face, I let him go and withdrew the roots back into the ground. Before too long, no one would even notice the disturbed soil here, and the trees of the hedgerow would have long, strong roots reaching further to bring them nutrients. For all I still had problems with Celestine, little Emma hadn't done anything wrong. Just like me, she'd cried of Mama leaving. For the first year. But slowly she had forgotten. She didn't remember her aunt at all anymore, which made my heart ache. She was the only person I hadn't turned my resentment towards at one point or another. I couldn't stand the sight of Robin, who had let my mother leave for some time. I had moved out into a small cottage meant for a farmhand that had fallen empty rather than living in the same space as him and Celestine. It had been cold and lonely, even with Emma taking to sneaking out to find me and cuddle me to sleep when I was at my worst. Rosalind, I think, saw me as stealing her sister from her and much of her mother's attention. It had only gotten worse when Emma first called me her sister. Taking Emma as an apprentice of my own had some appeal, but she was too young, too childish. And as soon as I could, I was going to go look for my mother. I wasn't going to stay. Thomas brushed himself off. Well, I'll be going. Donna's waiting and I'll take care of my treacherous little niece, he said, picking up his gear and making to leave. Bye, Uncle Tom! Emma shifted gears, waving at him as he left. Did your mother know you were coming to watch us? I asked, realizing she didn't normally come out this far. Oh... Uh, Emma said, gripping my skirt tighter as a look of intense concentration crossed her face. Oh, right, Mama said to come get you! She nodded vigorously. But you were fighting and magicking and it was so cool! 
I bit back a sigh. It would be a lie to claim I wasn't putting off whatever it was Celestina wanted for me today. I'd even half planned heading into Kiel to visit the blacksmith. I was probably going to have to get most of the things I needed for the designs I sketched out in my notebook custom made by a specialist, maybe even a gnomish specialist, but some things were simple enough for a typical blacksmith to provide. Assembling a drum car would be a pain. So many little wires. But the materials? Just wood, a bearing, some cogwheels, and maybe a belt, and lots of wire on the titular drums to do the carving. Of all the inventions I'd written notes for over the last few years, it was the most obvious one to start with. I could build a small-scale demonstration piece, show it off, and get it upscaled and improved once it had proven its worth. A water frame was probably more valuable on the whole. Spinning threads took a lot of work and a machine could do it better and more evenly than a human. But it was also harder to get set up. The biggest worry with a drum carter was having the idea stolen from me by someone else. I'd not been able to find much on Ghanaian patent law beyond King Greymane issues them. Unhelpful, really. Alright, lead me to her, I said, taking Emma's hand. It was a little startling at times the way she had shut up. So easy to remember her as a babbling toddler, whether now being a five-year-old girl and well over three and a half feet. I couldn't be much more than five foot myself, and any gain in height had slowed to a crawl. How did your lessons this morning go? Mother had me plucking weeds, she said, wrinkling her nose up in disgust. After a moment she started chattering on about the herb lore Celestina decided on for her lesson, and I spoke in here and there or asked a couple of questions. For all she disliked the messy part of handling the plants, she thought the results of taking care of them, or using magic on them, was cool. So she soldiered on, even with the bits she disliked. It was amusing how my own vernacular had slipped into hers here and there, Emma trying to emulate her big sister. I felt where Celestine was before I saw her. She was meditating in her grove and blending herself with the spirits in a way I had come to be familiar with. I did it myself. I wouldn't be anywhere near as good at manipulating plants if I didn't. But I wasn't invested in one spot in the same way Celestine was. She had her growth and it was sacred to her. Maybe one day I would do the same, but I doubted it. Mama! Emma cried, alerting her mother to our presence. Not that she hadn't already known we were approaching, having been tracking us for the last hundred paces or more. I brought Gwen like you asked! We walked into the grove proper. It had grown more over the years. Many of the trees were still quite young, save the old oak and its heart. It had expanded too. Wildflowers and a small grassy meadow that I knew sheltered a warren of rabbits and dozens of other small animals sprawling out and digging a bite out of the farmland. What was lost in land was made up in simply how healthy everything around the grove was, and a beehive that had been set up beside it. I didn't know when removable honeycomb frames had been invented, but Azeroth hadn't had them. It had been something of a shock when I found a farmhand who kept bees on a site, helping to pollinate the fields, having to tear at the wicker hive and near destroying it to get any honey. Building a bee box with proper frames hadn't been all that hard. They weren't complicated, just a bit of trial and error to get spacing right. Now just about every farmer around Kiel had them. A real tangible change I had made to the world. There were definitely still ways they could be improved, but it's not like I'd been into beekeeping before. I just remembered what beehives looked like, and I saw people lifting the lids off, taking down the frames, and there was honeycomb on them. Next time though, I was going to try to get a patent or royalties for what I made. I hadn't seen a single thing in return outside of some honey I got gifted by the farmhands. Thank you, daughter, Celestine said, her tone far stiffer than she normally took with Emma, giving us both a firm nod. Gwyneth, apprentice, it is good you are here. I nodded back politely. You asked for me, teacher? When it came down to it, I didn't hate her. Over the years, she had explained, at length, how she couldn't have forced Mama to stay. And I understood that. But she had also made it so I couldn't say goodbye. Prevented me from to try and convincing my mother myself. Stopped me from being able to choose to go with her. I didn't hate her, but for all she was still my teacher, I was still learning from her, I would be happy when I could finally leave. 
so I'm here. What I would do when I found her, I didn't know. Hug her and cry? Tell her I loved her? Scream at her for abandoning me? I loved her. I still loved her. Every night she wasn't there hurts. She chose to hurt me. It was complicated. Celestine nodded again, her gaze shifting to her daughter, who was herself glancing between us curiously. Daughter? Yes? Emma asked innocently. I need to speak to my apprentice alone. I'm sure your father has chores for you. But Emma protested before stopping herself, her cheeks puffing out unhappily as she pouted at Celestine. Recognizing she wasn't going to shift, Emma deflated. Okay. Bye, Gwen. She said, marching off with little stomps of displeasure. See you soon, Emma. I said back, getting the tiniest of sad waves back. I turned back to Celestine, crossing my arms across my chest. So what is it, teacher? Over the last 40 years, you've shown incredible growth. You've come to demonstrate skills with all but the most secretive of our arts, and even beyond, Celestine said, closing her eyes. At the age of 12, you are my equal in medicine and healing, greater in herb lore. Know our histories and stories as well as any could ask. Have proven capable in performing the tasks and duties set out for us for many years now. She kept going, listening out to various areas of my learning. From studying the astral science, the constellations in the sky that held some degree of power that could be drawn upon, all the way down to tasting the wind and weather and forecasting what would come. Even going so far as to speak of my success in guiding her own daughter, helping to teach Emma her letters and to read and write. Bit by bit, I felt my excitement growing. This felt like the time. Was she going to tell me where Mama went? Where to look? Finally, after what felt like an hour of her heaping praise upon me, closer to just 15 minutes, Celestine stopped, her eyes opening and meeting mine. There is nothing left to teach you, my apprentice, she said, a strangely sad glint in her gaze. I cannot put you forth to join the coven, not yet. The others would decry you as too young, and rightly so. You have yet to even begin your cycles. Yet I cannot in good conscience withhold from you the promise I made three winters ago any longer. I held on, struggling to find lessons to last you this winter. But now spring has come. Finally, I muttered, forcing myself to stay still. I felt giddy inside. I was going to be free. I couldn't wait to tell... I... I was going to have to tell Emma that she wouldn't be happy. That was going to be miserable, no two ways about it. If Celestine hurt me, she didn't show it. Your mother forced a promise from me, a promise I told you on that day. I rolled my eyes, my legs started to vibrate with impatience. She told me her plan had been to head north, north and east. The lands along the river Aravas have long been the closest to the light and are often... Celestine struggled for words for a moment. Serviced by the Magi of Dalaran, she fought to avoid us, avoid all who followed the old ways, and simply vanish. Where? The Aravas ran all the way from Elam Vale and Loron down into the marshes and out to sea, describing it like she had covered almost the entirety of the borderlands. And it was the worst place for Mother to have gone. The entire place would get cut off by Gen when he built his stupid wall. I could not let her stay there. I had no idea how long it was until the wall would get built. Else I didn't even know what year it was. Not for lack of trying, either. Kilneas didn't use the oh-so-convenient dark portal-based calendar I remembered. No, it used the Arafornian calendar. Or some of the Safir nobles kept a calendar based on Kilneas' founding. It was... 2814 AAE. After the Arafornian Empire. And while there wasn't a date for when the Dark Portal opened in the history books, they did have one for the start of the second. Except there were multiple. I'd had access to Baron Hagen's library for a while after I helped heal his son after a riding accident. He had a book from Silvermoon that said the second war started in late 
2858 RA, Reign of Anastarian, which corresponded to 2805 AAE. Except another account said it occurred early that year, and yet another account, this one from Gilneas, said it started in 2803 AAE, with the start of the Siege of Kasmodan by the Orcish Horde. Even when the Second War ended wasn't clear. The Elven account said it was over when the Orcs left Silvermoon, others with the Battle of Blackrock Spire and revenge being taken for the cowardly ambush of Anduin Lothar, and yet more when the Sons of Lothar broke the connection to Draenor for good and were lost, which was years later. I could be sure I still had some time left. The wall went up several years before the Third War started, but I couldn't be sure of how long it was until either. She fought to go to the lands of the Merleys. She named both Peerwood and Amber Mill's options. Celestine answered my question. I can't tell you if she remained there, but Irwin has already left attention in her wake. I snorted. Mother was, is, gorgeous. And you inherited her looks, Celestine said, smiling wryly. Emma may be as jealous as I was when she grows older. An odd thought, and not one I'd really considered. I knew I looked like my mother, that I got compliments here and there, but I didn't care that much. I looked after my hair because I loved having long hair, impractically long hair. I shook my head, I was getting distracted. Hopefully not, she's adorable, more of Robin in her than you, even if she got your nose. I joked, smiling to show I wasn't trying to be hurtful. Amber Mill was the place that the kid in Thor had taken over after the Third War. It was right on the border with Dalaran. But Pierwood? Pierwood? The village of the Worgen who changed each night. Below... Shadowfang Keep? No, Silverlane. It wasn't Shadowfang yet. And was ruled over by the Silverlane Barons, who were under Lord Murley. I wasn't likely to bump into any of them, but it was good to know who the local lords were. Baron Hagen answered to Count Ashmore, who then answered to Duke Kandrin, who ruled over the headlands as a whole. I dealt a fair bit with the Baron, but outside the time Mother helped Kandrin with his wife's rose garden, I'd never been near him, and the Counts were hands off keel. Hagen was decent with the Mayor and the Charter holders. My thoughts already whirling, I was ready to go, itching to start packing and leave. I would have to say goodbye to Emma. She wouldn't be happy, but... I was going to go. No amount of puppy dog eyes or pouting would stop me. Gwenef... Gwen... What? Celestine so said, trailing off before letting out a long sigh. What do you plan on doing when you find her? I froze from where I was absentmindedly starting to leave the grove. After? I would have to start... Something. Get her behind the safety of the to-be-built wall. Try and make connections to let me at Greymane, or the mages of Dalaran, so I could warn them about Arthas. Start a good and proper industrial revolution? No, I had to find Mother. I had to see she was safe, but... I knew what one of the things I had to do was, and what Celestine really wanted to hear. Even if it wasn't for years yet, I needed to say it. Once I found her, and know she's safe, I'll come back to see Emma. I promised to be there when she becomes an apprentice. I won't break that. Other than that, maybe I'll go visit Heather by Emberstone, if I don't find myself busy with projects. Like your beehive and what's in that little book of yours. Mm, yes. She knew about my notebook, but since I started writing in English, she hadn't a clue what was in it. Still had pages in Anaphorian and Galnean, mostly herb lore and lesson notes, for the practice but my personal ideas were all in English. A code I doubted even the gnomes would find fun to crack. Those sorts of projects. I brought my gaze back to my teacher, the woman who had... She was family, and I had worse family. I almost wish we were closer, like we had been when I first came here. Maybe time away would help. Thank you, Celestine. Cousin. You've been a good teacher. Her eyes had the glint of tears in them. Pack well, Gwyneth. I will be there to see you off. 
I nodded and gave her a sad smile before I left the grove. It was a better parting than I had expected to have three years ago.